homes throughout the area, and that's really where community begins. Community is one of the cornerstones of our spiritual growth. And let's face it, no one should be an island, and groups are where we build impactful relationships and we grow in community. As we grow in relationship and friendship with one another and study God's word together, we also grow in our walk with him. So in Acts 2, 46 through 47, it says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily to those who were being saved. This is a perfect example of what we are doing here at High Ridge. We are being obedient to God's word, not forsaking the fellowship of the saints, and it's all about connecting with other people, building community and establishing friendships and growing in our relationship with God. That's right. Maybe you'll join a group this semester. Maybe you'll even lead one. You can register online or in person after church on September 3rd at our group's kickoff. Yes. We'll have a good variety of different groups, so make sure that you check out our website, highridgechurchca.com, for more information. Awesome. Sauce. <laughs> All right, how you guys doing today? Hey guys, welcome to High Ridge. So good to see you guys today. Wasn't that a great time in God's presence? Did y'all love that today? So great connecting with the Lord. Well, my name is Levi, uh, pastor here at High Ridge Church, alongside so many awesome dream teamers out there who serve and, and make this possible every single Sunday. And so, so glad you're here. I want to welcome all the first-time guests in the house. If you're a first-time guest, let's give a big cheer for you. Hey, we're so, so, so excited you're here and just pumped. I, I want to meet you, my wife right here. Uh, Pastor Monica, you want to raise your hand there? That's my wife. And so um, we also would love to meet you right after service, right outside those doors. Just give you a hug, high five, whatever you like. Uh, dap up, the kids call it, the little dab thing. Yeah, whatever. Okay, you know what I mean. That was terrible. Anyway, I need somebody to help me dab up. Uh, but yeah, so we want to meet you and connect with you. And so if you would, if you could fill out the connect card right there on your seat and go ahead and fill that card out and you can take it to the information center right outside these doors. We have a gift for you. So we just want to give you something today. Uh, we're not going to ask you for a bunch of stuff. We just want you to enjoy yourself in God's presence. Also want to welcome all of you who are watching online. Thank you so much for faithfully connecting with us. And I know there are many of you that watch in different places. And so we just want to say thank you so much for connecting in. Well, a few uh, announcements real fast before we get into God's word. We have growth track today, part two. And this is where um, we have, uh, this is the growth track is a two-part class where step one, you learn all about who we are as a church and what we believe in and our vision, vision and mission. Step two, today, we're going to take the spiritual gifts assessment. And you're going to learn what your spiritual gifts are and how you can plug into the body. And so it's going to be 1130 to 1230. You can go to Information Center. They'll tell you what room um, back behind us that we're going to meet in. And if you can even start in step two. So we just want you to get going, get moving. It's going to be amazing. Also, the second one is I just want to say, man, this Friday prayer worship night was amazing. Come on, all you guys who made it out. It was powerful. Now, let me just tell you this. Because of your generosity... Because of you giving, man, we were able to rent a facility. And, some, you know, because we are a, a portable church right now, but one day we're going to have our own building. Come on, somebody. It's coming. I believe it. But we are a portable church. That means that every time we rent a space, it obviously costs money, right? And then we, so we rented out um, My Do Community Center, and we had lots of you show up, new people come. And we had a time in the Lord, and, and people, were, you know, people worship before the Lord. And uh, we had two people get saved. Come on, two people get saved. We had many people get filled with the Spirit. So it was amazing just to see God show up and move and people were prayed for and there were so many breakthroughs and so many things that happened in the families and the lives of others. And it's because of your generosity. So I just want to say thank you. And if you're wondering, man, is, you know, my money, when I give here, is it, is it going anywhere? Well, first of all, I want to say you're not giving to us, you're giving to the Lord, right? You don't give to High Ridge, you give through High Ridge. And this is what happens. Because you gave, we had lots of life change happen on Friday night. Every Sunday we see life change happen. This morning's going to happen. God's already moving, and it's because of your faithful generosity. I just want to say thank you for that. All right, y'all ready to get into God's word? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Father, for just what you have for us today. 
I pray, Lord, that we open up our hearts today as we receive your word and we move closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we are kicking off a two-part series titled Better Together. And what we're going to do is learn how it's important for us to be together and how being together matters. You know, we're kicking off in September, uh, we're kicking off groups, our fall groups. And so if you are not in a group, I want to encourage you, sign up for a group, sign up for a group. You can go to harvestchurchca.com. You can go to Information Center. We'll get you in a group. Maybe you want to lead a group. But I feel like for the next two weeks, I want to just to, to just share with you how important it is to be together and kind of talk about some of those issues on, or, you know, why we don't come together. Um, I've seen so many people isolated and so many people that it's hard for them to build community because they have been hurt before. And so I just want to teach you today from God's word how important it is for us not to only to connect to God, but also to connect to each other. Life change happens when we connect together. Somebody say we're better together. We are better together. So all right, let's get into his word and let's start. So one of the major truths that we must understand is that God does not want man to be alone. He does not call us to be by ourselves. So if you may call yourself, you know, I'm a loner, you know, I like to be by myself. And here's the deal. Yes, we should be by ourselves sometimes and, you know, be able to, you know, connect and just hang out to ourselves. I like to do that, too. I'm a people's person. I like to get in front of people. I like to talk to people. If you know me well, I like to talk a lot. So this is a great career for me. <laughs> it's an actual calling. It's not a career. Uh, because I like to talk. My dad thought I was going to be an attorney because I talk so much. So he said, you know, you'd make one. But I like, but there are those times where I just need to be by myself. Come on, those who have kids. You just want to be by yourself. And that's great, but we got to be together. God did not design for man to be alone. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 says it's not good for man to be alone. Deuteronomy 1 says that one sends 1,000 to flight and two sends what? 10,000 to flight. Which means we are better together. See, God is a relational God. And he had 12 people, 12 disciples that he poured his life into. Why? Because it wasn't just him walking around by himself, changing lives. No, he did it with 12 people and poured his life into them. I mean, they didn't know where, where Jesus was going half the time. You know, they would turn, you know, loaves and fish into food. I mean, I mean, Jesus out there having a fish fry. Come on, fish fries. They didn't know what was going on, right? Jesus healing and, and all these things that were going on, but they were together. They're out there walking on water. Peter's walking on water and Jesus is walking on water and all the disciples are in a boat and they're seeing. But they, every time life change happened, they did it together. And, and I want to just encourage you today that you will never be where God's called you to be or do what God's called you to do by yourself. So as Christians, as believers, we have to get past this. We have to. We have to get past the fact of coming to church every Sunday, listening to a message, hearing worship, and walking out those doors thinking that we're okay. In reality, you're not okay because we need somebody to tell us that we're not okay sometimes. And this is why it's so important for us to understand is that we are better together. See, God took a small group of 12 and flipped the world upside down. Could you imagine what we could do together as a church? If we were together, if we really tapped into our gifts and talents, what would this world look like if the church was together? What could God do? What impact could be made? See, if the church is going to grow, it's going to have to grow relationally. I like this quote, church is not an event that you attend, it's a family that you belong to. We're part of a family. We're part of a family. You may say, well, I don't have family. All my family is past or, or I can't connect with my, my actual family. You have a family here. This is what the church is supposed to be. This is why we are here and, and this is why the church is designed so that we can connect and grow together. Somebody say together. Yeah. All right, I'm trying to wake y'all up today so I may keep saying that, okay? Even in the early church, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, says all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Fellowship was very important in those days. And to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. The word fellowship in the Greek is koinonia. And there are two aspects to 
the word fellowship, koinonia, here, here they are. Number one, koinonia means sharing in participation. So if we say that we're in fellowship and we're connecting with believers, if, you, if you're not sharing or participating, then you're probably not connecting with believers. Number two is koinonia means intimacy. That means that we have to let our hair down. Come on, let's let our hair down. Let's shake it up a little bit. Let's just be ourselves and let's just let somebody else know what's going on with our lives and we need to connect. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 11 says this, Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? I had a friend in high school, this was his pickup line, by the way. <laughs> He's like, girl, you know, two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can warm, how can one person like me keep warm alone? You know, every now and then he may, you know, catch one, but it was very rare. So the power of community comes not in a crowd of disconnected lives. It comes through authentic, deep-rooted relationships. What does that mean? Let's just break that down for a moment. That if you want to have community in your life, it comes through authentic, authenticity being real, being honest, letting somebody really know who you are behind the mask. Letting someone know your problems and issues in your life. Being humble and teachable enough to say, hey, look, I ain't got it all together. I'm not going to walk into this church and act like everything is all good. Man, I got problems in my marriage. I got problems in my finances. I got problems in my life. And listen, I can't do this by myself. I need somebody to help me and keep me accountable. Man, when you have somebody like that in your life, that is when you completely turn around. Koinonia, you have fellowship, true fellowship, is when you can just be authentic and real. Then it says deep-rooted relationships. Those relationships go way further than just say, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Oh, do you know so-and-so? Oh, yeah, I know so-and-so. But you don't truly know so-and-so. It's just like when someone starting to date and then they come to you, you know, as a pastor, you hear this a lot and they'll come to you and say, pastor, I think I found the one. She's the one. I said, oh, is she? How long have y'all been together? You know, and you know, how long has your friendship been going for? Cause that's what's really, that's what really matters, right? Your friendship. Cause your marriage is built on your friendship. Oh, you know, about two months. I said, oh, really? God spoke to me. Oh, he did. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. What's his last name? Uh, I don't know. You don't even know his last name? Because he may have a last name that you don't want attached to your last name or your first name, right? Like what if it's like Gumbo or Dumbo or Wumbo, right? There's some weird last names out there. Like you have to know who his last name is because that could make you say, you know what, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. Come on, somebody. If, if you want some orange juice, sometimes you don't need to squeeze the oranges. You just go buy some orange juice, Okay. And but you gotta know about the, you gotta at least know their last name. Don't come and say God said. I mean, know their last name. But we have to go deeper than the surface level. And many of us, you'll never do what God has truly called you to do. You'll never be where God wants you to be by yourself. But we think that we can do this by ourselves, but you cannot do it by yourself. This is why God says He wants God sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross. Why? For relationship with you. Not just so you can be saved. We talk about this a lot because it's so important for us to understand is that we need to have a relationship with Jesus and a relationship with each other. See, so why do we need community? Number one, real life change happens in the context of relationships. Just like the scripture, when you read the scripture, you can't just read one scripture and that's it. You have to give a little bit of context, right? Right? I don't know about you, but I've read the Bible before, and I've heard preachers preach certain verses a certain way. And then until I started actually understanding the context, I was like, oh, that's not even what it meant. So when it talks about, you know, Paul, you know, saying I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, or when he's saying that you can do all things through Christ, it's actually him talking from a prison. And that totally changes everything. It totally changes the context. Just like our own life, we have to, real life happens in this context of relationship. You've got to know what the relationship is. You've got to go a little bit deeper than that surface level. Because we need God and people. We need God and people. And this is what I get nervous with about sometimes is that sometimes as Christians, we think that all we need is God. And obviously we need God. We know that. We need a relationship with him. So what will happen is 
will we'll wind up wearing this mask or will portray to be something to everyone else and we only go to God for everything, right? We go to God for everything, all of our issues, all, all of our mistakes. But here's the deal. Yes, we need to go to God. But you need to be honest with someone else so they can help you walk out what God has spoken to you and what he wants to do to you and through you. So we got to have somebody else that we talk to. So we need God and people. I'll prove it to you. James chapter 5, starting with verse 13. James, half-brother of Jesus, talking to believers. That's what he says. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. So who are we praying to? We're praying to God. Let them pray. That's God. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Who do we worship? Who do we sing songs of praise to? To God. Here we go. Verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Oh, so now we go to God, but then we also go to who? To people. Call on the elders of the church. Call on them. Then verse 15, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. This is so powerful to understand. Is that, man, you need healing in your body? We need people praying over us. We don't just go in our closet and say, God, heal me, God, heal me, God, heal me. And we don't go in, and we're not honest with anyone else. And they're not helping us to walk through things in life because we're embarrassed or we have trust issues or. But God says, listen, you got to find some people around you you can do community and life with. Because it's going to take God and people. Let's work. Verse 16. Therefore, here it is, confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. So now he's saying, obviously we confess our sins to Jesus. We know that to the Lord. But it also says confess your sins to each other. So there's this thing about being honest, being authentic, being real with somebody else and telling them the whole story. Because I tell you what, there's been people in my life where I trust them just enough to tell them some of the story. Because, you know, if I tell them a little bit, they don't need to know all my business. <laughs> they can know some of my business because I don't even trust them with some of my business yet. So I want to wait till I can trust them with all my business. Here's the deal. Sometimes we just have to find somebody, you pray and you just trust and you tell them everything. And it could be some of us that we, we've been holding on to some things and we're not being completely honest and real with somebody. And we wonder why we're not healed. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. That's the people. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Listen, we got to have somebody in our life that we can be totally real and honest with them. And I think one of the biggest things that I want to hit on today that we can sometimes deal with as Christians is that we are wearing a mask. A mask. Man, that mask is deceiving, right? We put this mask on and it's really... It's really effective in some ways because you can walk into a church and you're cool. Like I remember um, I was on staff at a church years ago and my office, I can see the actual parking lot. You know, I, I would go through the, the blinds. I would look in the blind. You see people driving in, driving up the driveway. Well, here's the deal. You would see them, boy, screaming at each other, yelling, sit down. I mean, one guy was just flinging his hands all around. I mean, this is Texas. They be, they be spanking their kids, okay? I'm not sure if you can say spanking in California. I just know in Texas, you can spank, old school spank. And he's just whipping them and driving and spanking and coffee spilling. And the wife's like, no, no. And he's, Aah. and boy, when they got up to that parking spot, those kids buttoned up. They got out that car like, like little ducklings, you know. And they're just walking out and they come up and they walk up. And I'm just cracking up. So I walk out and I go to the door. I am now the greeter. I can't wait to see this. And when they walk up, how's it going? Good to see ya. How are things going, guys? Amazing. Everything's wonderful. He grabs his wife. Come on, honey. God is so good, isn't he? And then I look at the kids, and one little girl was like. <laughs> and the poor thing is crying and all this stuff. But how can we go from, from one extreme to the other? Because we have been... And our mind thought that, you know what, as long as, you know, God knows my stuff, only God can judge me. We get tattoos, only God can judge me. And as long as God knows, then we cool. 
No, no, no. You need, also, you need people too. And so the problem is, yes, God knows and God's working on his heart, but you can hide it just enough for me to keep you accountable as your pastor or as your leader to tell you, hey, man, you can't be swinging like that. Right? Like, hey, let's take a deep breath. Let's pause. <sighs> hey, y'all take two cars for a while. Okay, y'all just start there, and then you can walk up to the church, you know, and then, one, then you can graduate to the one car. I don't know, I'm just throwing out stuff. But you know what I mean? Like, there, there, there's a mask. So, the different masks that I want to hit on today, and the first one is the everything's okay mask. All right. Here we go, guys. It's going to be fun. This is the everything's okay mask. So, here's the deal. I can't really see through these holes. If I fall, y'all better catch me. All right, this is the everything's okay mask. Everything's okay. How's it going, Susie? Everything's okay. How's your marriage? Everything's okay. How's life? Oh, it is okay. What do you mean it's okay? Everything is okay. God is so mighty. God is so powerful. God is so wonderful. Everything is okay. Here's the problem with this, 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 uh, this mask. I'm going to take it off now. I got nerve. I'm, I'm going to want to fall off this thing with this mask. Behind this mask, we refuse to be vulnerable. We refuse to tell everybody that there's probably some things in my life that's not okay. And we will start to think in our mind that everything is, is okay. And this is what this, this mask, where this mask leads to. It leads to depression. And I tell you, man, when we, we're trying to, and, and, then, and then what happens is that when everything's okay, you'll find yourself people-pleasing. You want everybody to know everything's okay. And you'll, you'll wind up telling your kids, hey, shh, everything's fine. If anyone asks about how things are, everything's okay. But, but here's the deal. One day you will crack. And one day you will be in a mental hospital. Right? Eventually you got to say, listen, not everything's okay, man. Everything's not always okay. We know not everything is okay. And it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to let everybody know that things are not always okay. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. This is what happens. When you wear this mask and you think everything's okay, you wind up isolating yourself because now you are so worried about anyone ever knowing that your household is not perfect. And that your life is not perfect. And you're not this little, you know, little house on the prairie type Christian. Whatever that means. I don't know. Everything is perfect. Listen, man, we got to take that mask off. We got to give it to Jesus. We got to take the mask off. See, isolation is the problem. Community is the answer. So community is different. And, and being in relationships is different. Being in a group is different now when you think of it that way. Of, ah, this mask I want everyone to think I'm perfect and my life is great. Boy, when you take that mask off and you tell somebody what's going on in your life, even if you feel embarrassed, that's when the Holy Spirit, the, word, the Lord starts to work with you. And then that's when conviction comes in. And that's where you can actually hear what the Lord is telling you to do and actually do it. That's that mask. And I'll say this, I'll always stay as sick as my secrets. Boy, we got some secrets, don't we? And I told you, I'm always going to be honest with you. And, and I'm always going to shoot you straight with love. But many of us, you're wondering why you're sick all the time. We may wonder why we're always in the hospital. We wonder why we're always feeling down and depressed and we're, we're calling it allergies. We're calling it this and that. But really, our heart is sick because we have too many secrets that we're not called to bear. And so what we need to do is put down the mask and tell somebody your secret. Be careful who you tell because you don't want the whole church to know your secrets. But you got to find somebody you can tell your secrets to. Here's the next one that I want to talk about. And uh, this is the, what I like to call, it's going to take me a little bit, so excuse me. I like to call this the superhero mask. Come on. The superhero. Y'all know what the superhero is. You know what the superhero is? Try to get this thing right. This one is, hey, you know what? I got it handled. 
I can do everything. You need help? I'm here. Oh, you want to know if I need help? No, I'm here to help you because I'm the superhero. I can do everything. Everything can be done through me because I have it all under control. I have my life all figured out. I don't need anyone to help. It kind of reminds me of the story with Muhammad Ali. You guys know Muhammad Ali, the uh, great boxer. And the, uh, the flight attendant goes to him one day. He's on an airplane and says, sir, I need you to put on your seatbelt. And Muhammad Ali said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she goes, sir, I need you to put on your seatbelt. Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she looks at him and says, sir, Superman don't need no airplane either. Come on. <laughs> and how many of us know that, listen, you can't figure it all out. We have to have relationship with people, and someone needs to be able to tell you that, listen, you don't have it all figured out. You need somebody in your life that can help you. If you don't, this is what happens. When you think that you can figure it all out, you start to think that you're God. Because that's the place that he has in our life, right? Where he tells us that he can figure it out. He can help us. He gives us guidance. He gives us wisdom. I'll just work more. We're going to get the house that I want. Maybe you shouldn't get the house right now. I know my marriage is going downhill. Don't worry. I'll figure it out. I'll read a book. I'll watch a podcast. She just needs to listen to me more. Because I have it all figured out. I have the answers. I know she wants to tell me her thoughts, but I have my own thoughts. I know God has his thoughts, but I have my own thoughts. And this breeds pride in your life. And I can't tell you more than this. We have so many people that are so prideful because they think that they can actually figure everything out in their life. And I want to encourage you, let's not walk. Let's not be the super, superhero. And then you'll find yourself, I wrote down some notes. This leads to burnout. To burnout. We see so many people that are burnout. They're trying to do everything, trying to figure it all out. They're trying to have all the answers. Listen, you're not going to always have all the answers. You have to ask God for the answer. The Bible says he gives us wisdom. Another thing that I've seen in, in church life over the years is that we will have people who are literally going through a lot in their own home. And this is hard. This is big. And what we do sometimes is we'll find ourselves, I'm trying to get this thing straight up here, we'll find ourselves doing this. You look at people, man, and they're just working a lot. For instance, if there's an issue in the marriage, the husband will work a lot. He'll work overtime. But, the, but there's an issue in the marriage. Then they'll come to church Pastor, I'll do whatever you need. I'll, I'll greet, I'll host, our kids ministry, and they're serving every week, all the time, all the time. And eventually as a pastor, you have to look back and say, ooh, how is their family? And what happens is they wind up getting so busy so that they don't have to deal with the issues at home. And it's because we have it all figured out. If I can just be busy, I'm doing the Lord's work, I'm making money for my family, yes, sir, but you can't figure it out. We need to take off the mask, take off the cape. We need to go to the Lord for guidance, and we need to fix the issue at home. Amen? All right. Let me put this mask. All right, the next mask, I love this one. This was actually pretty cool. I'm not going to put it on because it can't fit my head. All right. So this one is, I call the filter mask. The filter mask. Now, let me tell you why this is called the filter mask. Because this is the mask we put on where we try to make ourselves what we want it to be. I'm going to put it down now. <laughs> this is why this mask is very dangerous. It's because on this mask, this is what happens. You want everyone to believe you're something that you're not. How many of us have gone on social media? And boy, you can look like the prettiest girl in the world. You can look like the, I mean, the most handsome guy. One day you got little biceps, the next day you got gigantic biceps. One day you have no stomach at all. You just have a complete six pack. One day girls, they have big lips, then one day they don't have lips. Right? Come on now, I'm being honest with you guys. Because there's a filter on Facebook, you just put big lips. It's that simple. And you be whatever you want to be. You can also portray to the world that you're, you're doing just fine. 
You can make everybody look like you're rich. You can make everybody seem that everything's okay at home. I mean, have you ever gone on, on social media and you saw pictures of family and they're on vacation? And they take the best photos. We're on the beach and the kids are high-fiving and they're smiling with each other. But you know right before that photo, you, somebody got kicked in the back of the head. And you were screaming and yelling at them and sit down, sit, just get the picture going. Back. Everybody's grounded. Smile. And boy, when I saw the photo, I'm like, oh, look at that family. They are so cute. Wow, they're an amazing family. And we portray to be something that we're not. And we can write on this wherever. Then one day we could get to a point where we put that we're depressed because we want attention from everybody else. We want everyone to feel sorry for us. You ever seen people like that before? And you can make this whatever you want. And then teenagers, one of the biggest things with teenagers, this is what they get into because they want to fit in. They want everyone to like them. They're, they're, there's this void that they're trying to fill with acceptance from the world and from people. And I'm telling you, the only one that can ever fill that void in your life is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can fill that void. Because I tell you what, it's going to be a, a reality check is that when you see a girl on social media and you go pick her up and she don't look like the same girl or the same guy. Listen, we don't need to do that. We need to take off the mask and we don't need to portray to the world that we're something that we're not. We need to tell people, listen, this is who I am. And if you don't like me for who I am, you can get the stepping. Come on. You don't have to be around me. If I'm not good enough for you, don't date me then. I know one thing is I'm a believer, I'm a work in progress, and God is changing my life. Amen? There you go. So this is something that I believe that is, is huge for us in our society because, I mean, so many people are trying to be something that they're not. And I just believe that God, and I'll say this, God loves the real you. God loves the real you. Well, why did God make me a certain way? God loves the real you. Don't try to change who you are. We can't change who we are based on how we feel about ourselves. One day you feel this way, so now you change who you are. No, God made you a certain way, so this is who we are and who we're called to be. Amen? And, this is, and that's okay. It's okay who you are. God made you that way. All right, let's keep moving. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Listen, we need some people in our life who are faithful enough to tell us the truth and to be honest. It's okay. I tell teenagers all the time that, hey, if you have friends, like there's a thing now where I guess I just hear it around that if, you know, you have all these friends on Snapchat or social media, you can see I'm kind of aging myself. I'm killing myself right now. Anyways, but... It's all of a sudden, if you don't get right back to them right away, they won't be your friends anymore. Well, you don't understand. If, 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 if I don't respond to them right away, they won't, won't be my friends anymore. What? They're not your friends then. I'm old school. Like, if we're friends, we're friends. I don't need to talk to you every five seconds. Right? I'm here. I'm your friend. We need friends who are faithful enough to tell us the truth. See, the areas of our lives that are hidden are the areas of greatest danger. Think about those areas in your life that were hiding. Man, those, those areas need to come out. Those are the areas of the greatest danger. We need to take off our mask, and we need to give it to Jesus. Amen? So here's just a question I'll ask you is what mask do we have on today? And there's so many other ones that I could talk about today. But do the people, is there someone who knows the real you besides God? Because God always knows who you really are. The second reason we need community is because, number two, is that we have blind spots. We have blind spots. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you must live by the Spirit. Who live by the Spirit should, what's that word? Restore. Should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. I love this because we have blind spots in our life, and there are things that, that, that are going on in our lives that we just cannot see. But how amazing it is to have community where people can see what's going on in your life, and you allow them to speak to the blind spots in your life. Man, I've had so many blind spots where I thought that I was a certain way, and I look back, 
and someone said, hey, Levi, you're always doing this. I'm like, what? No, I'm not. And later I found out that I was. And you know what happened? In, those, in my younger days, it was hurting a lot of people. And for me, what it was is I was a Christian. I love God, but I would always make fun of people all the time. I was always making fun of people, talking about them, because I was so insecure on the inside that I had to hurry up and get you before you got me. And what people were telling me was like, hey, man, look, this is a blind spot for you. I know you've always done this, but you're hurting people. And there are some blind spots that we have that you could be hurting people, but we have to be teachable enough that when someone tells you it's a blind spot, then we got to be able to move forward. See, community helps you be restored. So where do we start? Here we go. Where do we start? And I want to encourage you today. We got to get plugged in, guys. We got to get into a group. Somebody say group. Group. We need to get in a group. We need to get in community. And I, and I want to share with you what to expect when you get into community, when you get in a group. All right, here are four things you're going to do. We call it ESPN. It helps us understand it, okay? <laughs> Remember it. ESPN. Number one, you're going to experience encouragement. I don't know about you, but I need some encouragement in my life. Anybody else need that? Some encouragement? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, 25 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together. It means don't neglect it. We cannot neglect the meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Listen, he's coming back soon. And what the church can do to stand out is to encourage people. We got to keep each other encouraged. We got to encourage each other. Community is God's answer to loneliness. Man, if you're lonely today, I got the answer for you. Step into community. Step into community. Number two is you're going to experience Scripture. The Bible is so powerful, right? Because the Bible is the written Word of God, but it's also alive. So when you, when you read God's Word, guess what it does? It transforms your life, life from the inside out. So if all fails, if you read the Bible, it's going to change your life. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Man, we got to get in God's word. How cool would that to be, to be in a group where at least you know every time you come together, you're going you're gonna to have encouragement, and then you're also going to get in God's word that really is gonna change your life forever. The next, number three, is prayer. So ESP, so P is prayer. So we're gonna have prayer. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20 says, for where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. I love how it says two or three. Uh, two is just a date, by the way, but three is a group, okay? So if you come together, three people, listen, we gotta be praying for each other. What I saw Friday night was so powerful, I saw a lot of people praying for each other and their lives are being changed. How cool would it be for you to walk into a small group, walk into a place where, man, you know you had a long week, and instead of going home and lashing out on your family or keeping it all in, holding it in, and feeling depressed, you have a place to go to where you can say, listen, I need some prayer. I need somebody to pray with. I am having a hard week. And they give you prayer. God heals your heart and your mind, and then you walk away to your family. Amen? Prayer is so important. What happens when we pray together? Here we go. Praying together invites the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. When you pray, it invites the power of the Holy Spirit into your life, into your situation, into your conversation. On the flip side of that, if we just tell people and complain and gossip, that's not allowing God into it. But man, when you decide to pray, the power of the Holy Spirit will be in everything that you're doing, everything that you're wanting. How powerful is that? Praying together increases the faith of a congregation to believe God for the miraculous. When you pray together, you stir up signs and wonders that could happen just in that little small group. Is that you need healing in your body? It can happen. You need healing in your mind? It will happen. You need healing in your marriage? You need healing in your relationships? Guess what? When you come together in that small group and you will pray, God does show up. Praying together moves people from seeking their own purposes to desiring God's purposes. It changes our mindset for it's not about us and our purposes, but it's what God wants to do inside of our life. And I don't know about you, but every day I have to ask God to help me with that. 
Because, because we are people that think about ourselves, a lot of times it's all about what we want and what we want to happen. But how cool is it that you get together and you begin to pray and God begins to put someone on your heart to help and to bless. That's what prayer does. Number four is next step. Next step. And what we encourage you to do here is take a next step. Take a next step. We should not be where we are today, right? Tomorrow, we should take a step in our journey. See, success is when you plug into your potential. Let me ask you this question. Have you truly plugged into your potential? Everybody I'm looking at today, you have potential. Everyone here, that are, if you're watching online today, listen, you have potential in your life. And when you decide to take a next step, then you will have potential. And what we've asked our small group leaders to do is to know where everyone is in their group. Do they need to be, are you saved? Are you baptized? Um, have you gone through growth track? Have you, are you part of the church? Are, are, are you serving and using your gifts? Are you leading? And your small group leader will help you take steps in your journey. So your potential is God's gift to you, but what you do with your potential is your gift to God. How cool is that to know? Is that God gives you this potential, he gives you this gift, but when you plug into your potential, that's you giving a gift to God. And boy, I've seen a lot of people who is, they have so much potential in them, but they're just one decision away from totally seeing their life and the lives around them changed. We got to plug in, y'all. We got to plug in. We got to step in. I'm asking as your pastor, like, hey, what is that step that you need? I want you to take a step. See, we're here to invite people on. I want you guys to see our mission statement today. And when the Lord gave me this mission statement, there were two words that really popped out to me. And it says that we're here to invite people on a journey. The word invite. So when you come here on a Sunday, when you go to an actual small group, every meeting we have, our job is to simply invite you on this journey that God has for you. Our job is not to make you, to manipulate, to make you feel guilty about doing anything. Our job is simply to invite you on this journey that God has for you. And maybe you're stuck in your journey. Maybe you're going the wrong way in your journey. But there's something that God has for you. And our job is to simply invite you on a journey. Here's the next part of it. Where they can, somebody say can, they can know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. The second word is can. Because we're not the hero, right? The church is not the hero. Our job is that if we invite you on this journey, you take a step, then you can. What would it look like? for you to truly know God. I'm talking about like truly know him, not just know of him, but truly know him in a way of, oh my gosh, okay, I'm invited on this new journey and what my life would look like to know God, have a relationship with God, to truly grow with God, to truly never ever feel alone in your life because the presence of God is with you. That the first person you go to, you go straight to Jesus Christ. Every single time, you, you actually know him. Here's another question. What would it look like if you could be free? If you could truly find freedom in your life? Maybe you've been stuck in some type of addiction or stronghold or maybe just in your mind. I don't know about you, but there's times where I've just battled in my mind worry, or anxiety, or stress. And I've learned that if I go on this journey towards Christ, then I can not only know him, but I can be free. Many of us today, we just need to get free. We need to get free, and it comes through community. What happens if you truly discovered your purpose? If you knew why you were here on this earth, and that you just didn't come to church and serve because you serve, but you say, you know what? I know why I'm here. I know what I'm called to do. Like, I can truly know why I'm here, and what happens if you made a difference, and you did something great in your life? This is kind of what community looks like to me, and then we'll end with the story. It's for me, I, never, I forget, the, the, the kids are real little um, at this time, and, you know, I didn't grow up, you know, doing the boat stuff, and I'll, you guys already know that. So I wasn't that guy. One day my wife kept saying, hey, you know, man, I would really like to go on the lake. Now, this lake was a cool lake, but she kept saying, hey, I want to go on the lake with the kids. Remember, they were real little. And I said, well, great. Um, let's go on. A, so I, I wanted to, you know, surprise her. So I went and got an inflatable boat, right? Not a real boat, but an inflatable boat and from Walmart. Okay. Anyways, 
So I go get this boat. I take them all out there. We're going to this lake. It was Ben Brick Lake, is, is a lake in Texas um, that I wouldn't ever jump in at all. And we go out there. And I got this boat, I'm out there pumping up this boat, and my wife's like, what are you doing? Because the problem was there was waves, like big waves. It was windy, it was crazy. I said, hey, it don't matter, we're going. Because remember, the, the weather changes quickly. And so I said, no, we're going to go on this boat, and I'm so excited. The kids are like, yay, boat, 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 you know. So we get out, and I get it, I, I put us in this boat. <laughs> it wasn't that bad, guys. It was okay. It wasn't like terribly wavy, but it was. And I, I, I put the boat out there, I put the kids in, and I just remember my wife saying, hey, I would not do that. <laughs> so, so then all of a sudden, man, like I put my foot up and the waves just literally took us off. And when I say took us out, like we went out. And I had my little two oars, didn't even really know how to use the oars at all. But we're out there, the kids are screaming because the water splashing us in the face, and I'm out there with these oars trying to get us back. And you can see people all on the sideline, right? They're all out there and they're, they're laughing. And, uh, <laughs> and then some are taking, you know, video with their phones and, and all this stuff. But nobody's trying to help. And I look over at my wife over there. And she, I mean, it's pretty far away. And you know what she does? She jumps in the water. Oh, yeah, she can swim. Yeah, she can swim. Jumps in the water and she just, kss, 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 kss. And I'm sitting here like, help <laughs> anybody come on and I'm, I'll tell you I dropped the one oar I had one oar this is a true story guys I, I don't feel good about this don't make fun of me all right but I'm sitting there I'm going with one oar and she comes out swimming she gets to the boat and starts doing this she is rescuing us and then I get my oar and I'm like helping and people on the sideline are watching they're all clapping and all that stuff and I felt terrible and we got back somehow thank you for saving me my wife saved me. Thank you. This story came to my mind because of this. There are so many people on the sideline looking at what you're doing, seeing what's going on with you in your life. They got their opinions. They want to take footage or video. They'll give you their, but there's always that one person in your life that should be jumping in at any cost and it can pull you back towards Jesus again. And I want to challenge you today as we end the service. Who is the one that you have? Who is that one person that you can say, you know what? I know if I was out in the middle of a lake, <laughs> they would jump in and save me. They will pull me back towards Jesus. Amen? And I want to encourage you to take a step into a small group. I want to encourage you to take a step in community. And I'm telling you, your life will be changed forever. Amen? All right, let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, we thank you, Lord, for helping us to just hear your word today. I pray, Lord, that you help us walk into community. I pray, Lord, that if there's somebody here that just needs a touch from you, I pray they'll get that touch from you and by being in community. In Jesus' name we pray. One more prayer before we leave. You're here today and you say...